how do you get a element? 5,000 tons for each delivery. You're standing on the coast of Northern Europe, looking out over the calm Baltic Sea. Nothing about it feels extreme. No towering cliffs, no raging waves, just 18 kilometers of quiet water separating Germany from Denmark. But beneath that surface, something extraordinary is happening. Europe is spending billions of euros to sink nearly 90 concrete giants, each weighing 73,000 tons, onto the seafloor. Not to build a bridge, not to drill a tunnel, but to float an entire tunnel into place and then deliberately sink it. It sounds impossible, concrete doesn't float, and tunnels aren't supposed to be built like ships. Yet this project is real, and it may completely change how humans build under the sea. This is the story of the Femarn Belt Tunnel, one of the boldest engineering projects Europe has ever attempted. On a map, the Femarn Belt looks insignificant, a narrow strip of water between northern Germany and the Danish island of Lowland. But for decades, this small gap created a massive problem. There was no direct road or rail connection between Central Europe and Scandinavia. Cars, trucks, and trains couldn't just drive straight across. Instead, vehicles had two bad options. Take long detours hundreds of kilometers north, or wait for ferries that ran on fixed schedules. The ferry crossing itself took around 45 minutes, not counting waiting, loading, unloading, or weather delays. For tourists, that was manageable. For freight, logistics, and international trade, it was a bottleneck. Every delay meant higher fuel costs, higher labor costs, slower delivery times. In a continent that depends heavily on fast, efficient transport, that 18-kilometer gap became one of Europe's most frustrating infrastructure weaknesses. The construction of the Femarn Belt Tunnel is as much a feat of industrial choreography as it is of civil engineering. And the story of how it is being made is every bit as incredible as the idea itself. At the heart of the project lies a purpose-built production complex near Rodbihan on the Danish island of Lolland, where a tunnel factory larger than 100 football fields has risen from farmland to manufacture the 89 massive concrete elements that will form the world's longest immersed tube tunnel. Inside this factory, some of the most advanced machinery on the planet hums around the clock, guided by a workforce that at peak has numbered about 2,000 direct construction workers on site, along with hundreds more employed by roughly 700 subcontractors across Denmark and Germany, and potentially creating up to tens of thousands of man-years of labor across the lifespan of the project. Skilled workers, technicians, machine operators, welders, crane crews, and engineers. Element interlocking with each element that provides flexibility. Mm -hmm. The element it itself. Has it has nine, nine, nine has flexible joints. Yeah. yeah. Work side by side with automated systems and robotic welding machines that handle over 70% of reinforcement steel fabrication a world-first application of such robotics to this scale of structural steelwork, fed by magnetic cranes capable of lifting five-ton steel bundles at a time. Gigantic overhead crane systems move steel cages and formwork into place, while automated concrete pumps deliver thousands of cubic meters of concrete into molds that will become the tunnel's segments. Each standard tunnel element 217 meters long, 42 meters wide, and almost 10 meters high, is built from nine segments that together require roughly 3,000 cubic meters of concrete each, equivalent to enough concrete to build dozens of apartment buildings, and weighs around 73,000 tons once complete. Beyond the factory halls, a fleet of heavy machinery, including the world's largest dredgers, specialized barges, tugboats, and tugging systems work offshore to carve out the 12-meter deep trench on the Baltic Sea floor that will receive the tunnel pieces, dredging an astounding around 19 million cubic meters of seabed material that is then repurposed on land for new coastal landscapes and recreation areas. Once cast and sealed, 
Each tunnel element is floated out of the dry dock, buoyed by its own hollow design like a giant concrete ship, then tugged slowly into position with precision that rivals satellite docking technology, before being lowered into the prepared trench where massive clamp and gasket systems lock it in place to form a continuous undersea tube. It is a ballet of machines and people, of steel and concrete, of meticulous planning and rugged labor, all moving in perfect synchrony to take an idea that once existed only on blueprints and bring it to life beneath the Baltic waves. The pace and level of automation inside this facility make it feel far closer to a car or aircraft factory than a traditional undersea tunnel construction site. Once the reinforcement panels and specialized steel components are complete, they are transferred into one of five parallel segment production lines housed inside a hall nearly 100 meters long. Here, construction begins not with walls or ceilings, but from the ground up. Two base slabs are assembled side by side at the same time, each one forming the floor of what will eventually become a massive underground room. Why not just build a bridge? At first, the obvious solution seemed simple. Build a bridge. Europe already has some of the world's most impressive long-span bridges, so engineers studied the idea carefully. On paper, it was possible. In reality, it was a nightmare. The seabed beneath the Feymarn belt is soft and unstable, making massive bridge pylons extremely expensive to anchor. The spans would need to be enormous, driving costs even higher. And that was only the beginning. A bridge would interfere with major shipping lanes, disrupt bird migration routes, permanently alter the coastal landscape, require constant maintenance in harsh sea conditions. The price tag kept rising, the risks kept stacking up. Eventually, the bridge option was ruled out. What about drilling a tunnel? The second option was a traditional bored tunnel, drilled deep beneath the seabed using tunnel boring machines. This approach has worked elsewhere, but here it came with serious problems. The tunnel would need to be extremely long, very deep, built through challenging geology. That meant complex ventilation systems, difficult emergency evacuation routes, expensive long-term maintenance, high construction risk. Once again, costs spiraled out of control. Two familiar solutions, two dead ends. So engineers asked a completely different question. A tunnel built like giant Lego. The entire 18-kilometer tunnel is divided into 89 enormous elements. Each element is made of nine concrete segments, weighs up to 73,000 tons, is fully sealed and watertight, contains roads, rail lines, and service tunnels. Inside a single element are two highway lanes in each direction, two electrified railway tracks, a separate technical corridor for cables, ventilation, and emergency access. This isn't just a tunnel. It's an underground transportation building. And instead of building it in the open sea, engineers created something far more controlled. Along the Danish coast, engineers did not create a traditional construction site, but something far more unusual, a full-scale tunnel factory built specifically for this project. Inside this enormous facility, nearly every step of the process takes place indoors, protected from wind, waves, and weather. Steel fabrication, reinforcement assembly, concrete casting, and quality control all happen under one roof, allowing engineers to work with a level of precision rarely possible in marine construction. Ships arrive at the adjacent port around the clock, unloading thousands of tons of steel, which are lifted directly into the factory by massive cranes capable of handling multi-ton bundles in a single movement. And it kind of epitomizes the power of construction and its ability to change our world. From there, highly automated machines take over, cutting, bending, and welding reinforcement steel with millimeter-level accuracy replacing much of the manual labor traditionally required for such structures. The production pace is relentless. In just one week, 
The factory can manufacture tens of thousands of individual steel components, all identical, all precisely shaped for their exact position within the tunnel. This assembly line approach, more reminiscent of the automotive or aerospace industry than civil engineering, represents a level of industrialization almost never seen before in undersea infrastructure projects. And it is precisely what makes a project of this scale both possible and controllable. Concrete is incredibly strong under compression, but it's weak under tension. And these tunnel elements experience extreme stress. During transport, while floating, as they're lowered, once buried beneath soil and seawater. To survive this, engineers use post-tensioning. Hidden inside each segment are high-strength steel tendons. After the concrete hardens, these tendons are pulled tight using hydraulic jacks. This compresses the entire structure from the inside, dramatically reducing the risk of cracking. From the outside, the tunnel looks like solid concrete. Inside, it's under constant, carefully controlled compression, silently resisting the pressure of the sea above. Each tunnel element is assembled gradually. Segments are cast one after another inside the factory hall. As each new segment is completed, the entire structure slowly slides forward on rails. This clever system allows massive space savings, precise environmental control, perfect curing conditions. Temperature and humidity are carefully regulated to minimize cracking. By the time all nine segments are complete, a single tunnel element stretches out of the factory like a concrete train. But it's not finished yet. The completed tunnel element is moved into a dry dock, a massive basin sealed off from the sea. At first, the dock is completely dry. Then something unexpected happens. Seawater is slowly pumped in. As the water level rises, the 73,000-ton concrete block begins to float. This works because the tunnel is hollow and watertight. It displaces more water than it weighs. Just like a steel ship, its average density is lower than seawater. Concrete doesn't float by accident. It floats by design. Once buoyant, gates open and tugboats move in. They attach to anchor points on the tunnel element and slowly tow it into open water. This stage requires extraordinary precision. Engineers constantly adjust. Ballast, center of gravity, stability, waves, wind, and currents all matter. The element must arrive at its destination perfectly balanced, ready for the most delicate operation of the entire project. Across the entire tunnel, there are hundreds of joints, allowing slight movement while keeping seawater out. The tunnel behaves like a flexible spine, strong but not brittle. Once a tunnel element reaches its designated location, the most delicate phase of the entire operation begins. Deep below the surface, a precisely dredged trench is already waiting on the seabed, prepared months in advance. Guided by a combination of satellite GPS, sonar imaging, and laser-based positioning systems, the floating tunnel element is slowly maneuvered into position directly above its final resting place. Then ballast tanks inside the structure are gradually filled with water, and the 73,000-ton concrete giant begins to sink. The descent is slow, even, and completely controlled, with engineers constantly monitoring alignment, tilt, and movement in real time. A mistake of just a few centimeters at this stage could damage the structure or prevent a proper connection, so every adjustment is measured with extraordinary precision. When the element finally settles onto the seabed, it is aligned with the previously installed tunnel sections, achieving accuracy not measured in meters, but in millimeters. At that point, the challenge shifts from positioning to sealing. Between each tunnel element, lies a sophisticated waterproofing system designed to keep the Baltic Sea permanently outside the tunnel walls. At both ends of every element, engineers have installed massive steel rings fitted with thick rubber gaskets that wrap around the entire cross-section. As two elements are carefully pulled together, these gaskets are compressed under controlled force, forming a watertight seal 
capable of withstanding decades of water pressure. Behind this primary seal sit multiple layers of backup protection, including secondary gaskets, pumping systems, and continuous leak detection sensors. If even the smallest amount of seawater begins to infiltrate the joint, the system detects it immediately, allowing engineers to respond long before any damage can occur. It is a process where brute force and extreme delicacy coexist, placing structures heavier than warships with the finesse of a surgical procedure. The Feymarn Belt Tunnel isn't just about saving time. Once complete, it will cut travel time between Germany and Denmark dramatically, create a direct rail link between Scandinavia and Central Europe, reduce emissions by replacing ferry traffic, strengthen Europe's transportation network. But its real impact may be global. This project proves that undersea tunnels don't have to be dug slowly underground. They can be manufactured in factories, transported like ships, assembled with industrial precision. In the future, this method could connect places once thought impossible. Today, the Feymarn Belt Tunnel is still under construction, but it already represents something bigger, a shift in how humans think about building beneath the sea. One day, trains may no longer cross oceans on bridges or ferries. They may glide silently through concrete corridors beneath the seabed. And it all began with a simple question. How do you cross 18 kilometers of water without going hundreds of kilometers out of the way? Europe's answer was bold, heavy, precise, and floating. When the Feymarn Belt Tunnel opens, Europe's economic map quietly redraws itself overnight. What used to be an awkward break in the supply chain becomes a straight, uninterrupted artery connecting Scandinavia directly to the industrial heart of the continent. Trucks that once lost hours waiting for ferries will roll continuously, day and night, shaving time off deliveries, cutting fuel consumption, and turning unpredictable logistics into clockwork precision. Trains that previously had no direct route will suddenly flow from Stockholm to Hamburg and beyond without stopping unlocking faster freight corridors that make Northern Europe more competitive on a global scale. Warehouses relocate, ports expand, factories rethink where they build, and entire regions once considered peripheral become prime real estate for investment. Businesses no longer plan around weather delays or ferry schedules. They plan around speed, reliability, and scale. For exporters, this tunnel is not just concrete and steel, it is certainty. For manufacturers, it is lower costs and wider markets. For startups and service industries, it is access to talent, customers, and capital across borders that once felt far apart. In a world where minutes saved in transport translate directly into profit margins, the Feymarn Belt Tunnel acts like an economic accelerator, compressing distance multiplying opportunity, and turning an 18-kilometer stretch of water from a barrier into one of Europe's most valuable trade shortcuts.